Institute of Business Academy. Today we are going to see the daily current affairs of August 14th. So today we are going to discuss the topics of ILO to help farmers eliminate child labor forced work in cotton fields. So which comes under GS2 social justice. Next the egg or sperm donor has no legal right on child is longer which comes under gs3 environment next an overview of governance in delhi which we have to know under gs2 paper indian polity and constitution next st martin's island which we have to know under location next editorial analysis and finally the international organization topic So first topic is about ILO to help farmers eliminate child labor forced work in cotton fields. First we have to know about why it is in use. Cotton and hybrid cotton seeds from India are listed by US Labor Department as products made using child or forced labor. To address this issue, the Confederation of Indian Textile Industry and the International Labor Organization have launched a new project to end child labor. So, First, we have to know about this new initiative. So, the joint project promoting fundamental principles and rights at work aims to improve labor conditions among cotton farmers by promoting fundamental labor rights. Next, the focus area is the project will focus on freedom of association, collecting bargaining, elimination of child and forced labor, abolition of discrimination and ensuring a safe working environment. Next, the scope is the initiative will impact around 6.5 million cotton farmers across 11 states in India by upholding FPRW cotton growing communities can foster a more equitable, sustainable and prosperous environment for all workers leading to long term benefits for individuals and families. The project also aims to promote social finance and financial inclusion or bank linkage for farmers and agriculture workers and enhance their access to digital literacy programs of the government. Next, we have to know about child labor. The International Labor Organization defines child labor as work that deprives children for their childhood potential and dignity and is harmful to their physical and mental development. Next, the Sustainable Development Goal 8.7 aims to end child labor by 2025. Next, about the International Labor Organization. International Labor Organization is the only tripartite UN agency since 1919. It brings together governments, employees and workers in a of 187 members states to set labor standards, develop policies and devise programs promoting decent work for all women and men. Next, the functions of ILO is creation of coordinated policies and programs directed as solving social and labor issues, adoption of international labor standards in the form of conventions and recommendations and control over their implementation, assistance to member states in solving social and labor programs, human rights protection, the right to work, freedom of association, collective negotiation, protection against forced labor, protection against discrimination, etc. Research and publication of works on social and labor issues. Next, the objectives is to promote and realize standards and fundamental principles and rights work to create great opportunities for women and men to secure decent employment, to enhance the coverage and effectiveness of social protection for all, to strengthen tripartism and social dialogue. So with this, we have the UPSA prelims question which have been asked in 2018. International Labor Organization Conventions 138 and 182 are related to the answer is A, the child labor. So our next topic is ergo sperm donor has no legal right on child. So we have to know about the news first. The Bombay High Court ruling clarifies that egg or sperm donors do not have legal parental rights. This decision arose from a case where a donor sought to claim parenthood of twins born through surrogacy. The court upheld the legal framework and granted visitation rights to the biological mother. The Bombay High Court ruled that donation of eggs and sperm do not grant a donor legal entitlement to claim parenthood. The case involved a woman who donated eggs 
to her sister and brother-in-law for surrogacy. After the twins were born, the donor claimed a right to parenthood due to her biological connection. The High Court, led by the Justice Milan Jadav, rejected this claim, citing that donor's role is limited to being a voluntary donor, not a legal parent. We have to know about what is surrogacy. Surrogacy is an arrangement in which a woman agrees to carry and give birth to the child on behalf of another person or couple, the intended parents. A surrogate, sometimes also called a gestation carrier, is a woman who conceives, carries and gives birth to the child for another person or couple. Next, the altruistic surrogacy is. It involves no monetary compensation to surrogate mother other than the medical expenses and insurance coverage during the pregnancy. Next, the commercial surrogacy is. It includes surrogacy or a related procedures undertaken for monetary benefits or reward in cash or in other kind, exceeding the basic medical expenses and insurance coverage. So with this, we have the UPC prelims question which have been asked in 2020. In context of the recent advance in human reproductive technology, pro-nuclear transfer is used for fertilization of eggs in vitro by the donor sperm, genetic modification of sperm producing cells, development of stem cells into functional embryos, prevention of mitochondrial disease in offspring. The answer is B, prevention of mitochondrial disease in offspring. Next, the melting of polar ice due to climate change is making days longer. So we have to know about the news first. Recent research indicates that climate change is slowing the earth rotation due to melting polar ice caps which alerts the planet's moment of inertia. This subtle change affecting timekeeping and technology underscores the broader impact of climate change on fundamental planetary process and the urgency of addressing global emissions. Now what is the impact of climate change on earth rotation? Scientists have discovered that climate change in contributing to slowly in earth rotation. This phenomena is linked to melting of polar ice caps, which has caused the earth to spin slower. The slowing effect results in minuscule changes in the duration of a day, which while not significantly affecting daily life, could impact technology reliant on precise timekeeping such as computer networks and space travels. Next, the research, research findings. Research analyzed data from 200 year period and found the climate change has been slowed on earth rotation by about 1.3 million seconds per century over the last two decades. This would make climate change the dominant factor in slowing the earth rotation, surpassing other influences. Next, the implication for timekeeping. So despite the small magnitude of the changes, it can impact accurate timekeeping, particularly for atomic clocks, which were used for various technologies, including GPS, stock trading, and space travel. The Earth rotation has been gradually slowing due to lunar tidal friction, which already adds about 2 million seconds per century to the Earth's day. Next, the effects on Earth axis. The melting of polar ice also affects the Earth axis of rotation. Research indicates that melting ice is causing the Earth's axis to shift slightly over time. The shifting of the axis combined with the rising sea levels in the coastal areas underscores the broader impacts of climate change which go beyond just slowing the Earth rotation. So with this we have the EPC prelims question which have been asked in 2019. Which of the following statements is are correct about the deposits of methane hydrate? Global warming might trigger the release of methane gas from these deposits. Large deposits of methane hydrate are found in Arctic tundra and under the sea floor. Methane in atmosphere oxidizes to carbon dioxide after decade or two. Select the correct answer using the code given below. Here the answer is D. 1, 2, and 3. All the three statements are the correct statements. Our next topic is about an overview of governance in Delhi. So, first we have to know why it is in news. The Supreme Court has ruled that the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi can nominate 10 aldermen to Municipal Corporation of Delhi independently without consulting the Council of Ministers. This decision has intensified tensions between the Union Government, Delhi Government and the local government. How did this involve the Delhi Government to award? So, 
At the commencement of the constitution in 1950, Delhi was classified as Bharti state. Following the state recognition in 1956, it became the union territory governed by the administrator. The municipal corporation Delhi was established in 1989. In 69, the constitutional amendment in 1991 created a legislative assembly and council of ministers for NCT for Delhi. And however, the union government retained control over public order, police and land, excluding these subjects from the Delhi government jurisdiction. Now, why is there constant tension and friction between the union government and the Delhi government scene? Because the legal disputes control over key areas and the administrative conclusions. Now, what did the 1989 Balakrishna Committee recommend? They recommended on union territory status, on governance structure and the representation and accountability now how has this municipal corporation of delhi have been involved in the power tussle in both ways it have been involved first is multiple authorities and next is electoral conflicts so by revising governance structure and implementation of triple chain accountability also by promoting concerns based governance these are the ways to get forward of these issues so with this we have the UPSC mains question which have been asked in 2018. So whether the Supreme Court judgment July 2018 can settle the political tussle between Lieutenant Governor and elected government of Delhi examine. So you can practice on this question. Our next topic is about St. Martin Island. So we have to know about this place. The outstanding Bangladeshi PM Sheikh Hasina claimed she could have stayed in power if she had given up the St. Martin's Island and parts of the Bay of Bengal to the United States. So we have to know about this island first. This island is located in the northeastern region of the Bay of Bengal near the maritime boundary between Bangladesh and Myanmar. It lies about 9 kilometers south of the Cox Bazaar Tekna Peninsula in Bangladesh. The island is approximately 7.3 km long and is mostly flat with elevation of about 3.6 meter above the mean sea level. It is the Bangladesh's only coral island and surrounded by coral reefs that extend 10 to 15 km to the west northwest of the island. Next, the historical background. The island was originally the part of Tekna Peninsula, but gradually submerged into the sea around 5,000 years ago. It resurfaced approximately 450 years ago. Arab merchants were among the first settlers in the 18th century. They named it Jazira and later Narikal Jinjira, that is Coconut Island. In 19,000, British India annexed the India and it became known as St. Martin Island, named after the Deputy Commissioner of Chittagong. Next, the strategic importance. Near the Strait of Malacca, so close to one of the world's busiest maritime routes, making it strategically important for military oversight, it offers potential for monitoring maritime activities, including strategic interests of global powers. Next, the border with Myanmar, proximately to more, Myanmar, adds significance in regional security dynamic. Next, the other significance for Bangladesh is it is the part of Bangladesh economic zone so rich in marine resources like fish oil and gas also key tourist destination it is important for biodiversity with coral reefs and diverse marine life so with this we have the upsc prelims question which have been asked in 2023 consider the following past area of conflict mentioned in news country where it is located donbak syria kachin ethiopia Tigray, not Yemen. How many of the above pairs are correctly matched? The answer is none, none of them are correctly matched. So next, the editorial analysis. Our topic is about hints of the corporatization of science research in India. So first we have to know about the news. The article discusses India's shift towards market-driven scientific research, emphasizing commercialization and reduced public funding. It examines the establishment of Anshadan National Research Foundation under the 2023 Act concerns over declining curiosity, driven science and need for increased public funding and autonomy in research institutions. So, under this we are going to see the past trends of research in India. The past trends are revenue streams, 
Dehradun Declaration, Corporation of Science Research and Research Infrastructure, the ANRF and Research Act, establishment under the ANRF Act of 2023, operationalization of ANRF, funding and mechanisms, United States experiences, integration of science and technology, intellectual property rights, and finally the new liberal policies. The signals despite the stated objective. So they include the dictates of the capitalist market constraints from the private sector, government funding for Indian knowledge system, funding gaps, experimentation and analysis, and also the comparison with other countries are seen under the signals despite the stated objective. So now what are all the uh, India's achievements despite a low GDP investment in R&D? The first thing is high production of PhDs, robot research output, growth in patent grants, improvement in global rankings, and also the investment in autonomous R&D institutions. Now, what are the initiatives to foster R&D and innovation seen in India? The first is Sign Language Astro Lab. Sign Language Astro Lab. Next is Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, that is CSIR. National Physical Laboratory. Next, the One Week, One Lab Science and Heritage Research Initiative, Institute of Advanced Study in Science and Technology, National Initiative for Developing and Enhancing Innovations. Next, Mission on Advanced and High Impact Research. So, that's all from this editorial analysis. Next, under the international organization, we are will be seeing the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So, it is generally called as IORA. It was an intergovernmental organization which was established in 7th March 1997. It was formerly known as the Indian Ocean Rim Initiative and the Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional Cooperation. So the IORA Secretariat is based in Mauritius. It became an observer to the UN General Assembly and the African Union in 2015. It has 23 member states and 11 dialogue partners. China is a dialogue partner in the IORA. Membership is open to all sovereign states of the Indian Ocean Rim willing to subscribe to the principles and objectives of the Charter. Australia, Bangladesh, Comoros, France, or Reunion, Indian, Indonesia, Iran, Kenya, Madagascar, Malaysia. Maldives, Mauritius, Mozambique, Oman, Seychelles, Singapore, Somalia, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Tanzania, Thailand, United Arab Emirates and Yemen. These are all the 23 current member states. China, Egypt, Germany, Italy, Japan, Republic of Korea, Russia, Turkey, the United Kingdom and the United States of America are the dialogue partners. The Regional Center for the Science and Technology Transfer based in Tehran, Iran. The Fishery Support Unit are based in Muscat in Oman are the specialized agencies. Next, the two observers of this organization is the Indian Ocean Research Group, the Western Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. Their objectives is to promote sustainable growth and balanced development of the regions to focus on those areas of economic cooperation which provide maximum opportunities for development, shared interest and mutual benefits. To promote liberalization, remove impediments and lower barriers towards a freer and enhanced flow of goods and services, investment and technology within the Indian Ocean Rim. Next, what are the six priority pillars of this organization are maritime safety and security, trade and investment facilitation, fisheries management, disaster risk management, tourism and cultural exchange, academic science and technology, blue economy and women's economic empowerment. Their focus areas of Indian Ocean Rim Association is first under the blue economy and tourism. Their flagship projects are Indian Ocean Dialogue, Somalian Aim and Development Program, the IORA Sustainable Development Program, IORA Linsal Malayla, 
be the legacy internship program IORAUN Women Promoting Women Economic Empowerment in the Indian Ocean Rim Project. These are all the flagship projects of this organization. Their significance is the IOR has always made significant contributions to the world economy. The region is home to 35 percentage of the world population and also accounts for 19 percentage of total gross domestic product. Moreover, 80 percentage of a seaborne trade uses route through the Indian Ocean. Furthermore, 80 percentage of seaborne oil trade and 100,000 commercial vessels depend on this route every year. So that's all from today's news. To read this document, you can visit our website. Our website link have been provided in the description. To get more daily current affairs videos, follow our YouTube channel, also our Telegram channel. Thank you.